Hi, and welcome back to WVU Kamuk. I'm Elizabeth Cohen, an assistant professor of communication studies. Today I'm in my pajamas. Uh, <laughs> it's one of the benefits of online education. Well, it's really a benefit for me. Uh, I can't speak for you since you're the one who has to watch me in my pajamas, but that's okay. Um, yeah, so we're in our fourth week of WVU Kamuk, and this week we're talking about media multitasking. Um, in the last lecture, we talked about um, some of the cognitive foundations that you need to sort of understand how our brain handles multitasking. Um, today we're going to give um, you a little bit of perspective on the scope, uh, like who's doing the media multitasking and how prevalent it, it excuse me how prevalent it is and then um and we'll spend most of the time talking about some of the consequences of media multitasking on things like our productivity and social life um okay well let's go ahead and get started um here i have um marvin the multitasker though i guess that's kind of sexist isn't it we could have bald ladies. Maybe this is Mary the multitasker. I don't know. Anyway, you'll see um, that Mary Marvin's doing a lot of different things. Um, <clears throat> so let's just start off by um, talking a little bit about um, who's doing it, like um, what types of things people are doing when they're media multitasking. I just want to go over a little bit of research that I picked up. Um, I'll be honest, it's harder to find um, information on adult media multitasking, because what we'll talk about in just a second is that it's much more prevalent, excuse me, among um, younger generations. But that doesn't mean that it's not also extraordinarily prevalent among adults, um, myself being an example. Um, some of the stats I came across, almost a quarter of adults' media time was spent with more than one medium. And by the way, I want you to look at the year here. It's 2004, so it's almost 10 years ago, and that was a quarter of their time. Um, and, you know, I've sort of alluded before to how technology, the more portable it, become, more portable it becomes, um, the more accessible it becomes, right, uh, the, probably the more we would expect to find multitasking uh, using it. Uh, we didn't have tablet devices back in 2004, for instance. Now we do, so I would expect this number to be a lot higher if um, it was, you know, if the research was done again. 59% um, of Americans use computer to access the internet while they're watching TV, one of my favorite pastimes. <laughs> and 32% of adult IM users um, report that they multitask all the time. And 29% say that they do this some of the time. Um, the reason I think that's kind of interesting is because, you know, um, instant messaging when you do on your computer um, is, is the type of thing that that's, you know, uh, demands a quite a bit of attention if you want to respond back, um, you know, in real time to people. So, um, but the truth is, is that <clears throat> younger generations, of the research suggests, do tend to multitask the most. There's been a couple of uh, comparisons between different generations. You can see the first one up here talks about baby boomers engaging in an average of 23.2 uh, media multitask combinations. So this actually has to do with um, how many different combinations, for instance, like watching TV and using the internet, or driving a car and um, you know talking on the cell phone, those types of things. Um, that's what I mean by combinations. Uh, Gen Xers um, do engage in quite a few more combinations, but net geners younger than uh, younger than the uh, Gen Xers um, engage in still more. Okay. Um, you see here, a majority of uh, teenagers perform other tasks while listening to music, watching TV, and using a computer, and while, again, this is the one that always floors me, and by, while reading, it just seems like reading takes up so much energy, um, reported um, proportion of time spent media multitasking increased from 16% in 2004 to 19% in 2009 among 8 to 18 year olds. So again, you see this trend of, uh, however it was in 2004, right, it's getting, um, it's in getting increasingly common. And you can see here the breakdown of people who admit doing one particular media multitasking activity, which is texting and driving. Um, only 4% of boomers, but 36% of teen drivers. And, um, you know, I left our last discussion with the question of well, what do you think the implications are of not having a fully formed uh, prefrontal cortex and engaging in media multitasking? So when the bouncer of your brain, you know, the guy who's supposed to be filtering out what types of information you should pay attention to and what types of information you should ignore, um, isn't completely mature, <laughs> well, what are the implications for this? And it's, um, for me, a little bit scary to think about it when the people who are actually doing the most media multitasking while driving are the ones who don't really have that sort of um, executive control uh, completely developed in their brain. Um, these, are, these are just a couple of them, um, if you're more visual. Um, 
a couple of uh, tables to look at uh, with some interesting statistics. These are some weekly figures that they um, took looking at um, the total amount of weekly hours that um, uh, uh, teens were spending um, multitasking, but this breaks it down by primary and secondary tasks. So a primary task is what people would, that would be their, the, the task that they're putting the most attention to, and then the secondary task would be sort of the, the peripheral task that they're trying to do at the same time. Um, you'll see that television overwhelmingly, right, um, tends to be this primary task that people engage in, but then, I mean, six, on average, 16, um, almost 16 hours, or a little over 16 hours a week, um, followed by music. And then secondary tasks would be like, I mean, you can see computer seems to top number one. So that means there's a high likelihood of, as I mentioned before, people watching TV, but at the same time, you know, doing some computer activities at the same time. Um, if you want to sort of like examine these more closely, again, please, um, you can find these Prezi's, uh, uh, you can find the prezies to sort of go through at your own pace on the WVU Commook website. Um, here's another table that just, you know, um, makes it easy to compare some of these numbers. Um, you can see here that this is, um, again, a survey of youth. Um, in response to multitasking questions about um, how often they do certain types of multitasking tasks, I mean, this is pretty, <laughs> pretty unbelievable. Um, first of all, you'll notice that as far as reporting different multitasking, media multitasking tasks, most of the time, um, or most of the time or some time, okay, uh, they're all over 50%. So um, the, the seventh to 12th grader surveyed did this all or most of the, half, over half of them did this all or most of the time. Um, the most prominent one here is, again, do multiple things on the computer at the same time. Not really surprising. Again, the computer does kind of make that easy. Um, but you'll see other things like multitask, um, other media while listening to music or while using the computer. Um, <clears throat> so just a, another indicator of how common this is among uh, younger generations. Okay, um, now I want to talk a little bit about, uh, well, who who actually should be doing multitasking? Who's actually good at multitasking? There um, is research to suggest that uh, despite all of the brain limitations we've talked about, that there's um, a category of people called supertaskers. Um, approximately 2.5% of people um, could be considered supertaskers, and these are people who can juggle two tasks without seeing a decrease in performance. So again, just to sort of rehash some of the things we talked about last time, there tends to be a lag in um, the amount of time time it takes for you to do uh, perform a task if you're doing something else. Um, and, and if there's not a time lag, then there's certainly going to be some sort of um, accuracy lag, right? But for, for super taskers, they tend not to see that. Um, so, you know, if, it, it seems to imply that their prefrontal cortex is able to juggle those uh, different tasks at extraordinarily um, quick rates. Um, we do know also, though, that um, younger people um, in general, can multitask better than older people. Um, specifically, it just seems to be an inverse relationship between um, age and ability to multitask. So um, as people uh, increase in age, the ability to multitask gets older. And um, I think I've mentioned um, Dr. Adam Ghazali. He's a neuroscientist who uh, researches specifically this issue. Um, he he um, looks at the cognitive effects of aging and um, what happens as you know people start to lose things like working memory capacity um, and, and how that affects their ability to multitask later on. Um, evidence suggests that people who um, do the most multitasking, this is a pretty important, uh, the people who are actually doing the most multitasking are actually the worst at it. Um, and by the way, these people do tend to, the people who are also doing the most multi media multitasking also do think that they're the best at it. Um, so, and again, they turn out to be a little bit worse. Um, the research done on this is done by a communication, um, is done by a communication um, scholar at Stanford, um, Dr. Clifford Nass, um, and he's been doing a lot of studies trying to figure out uh, exactly what are the implications of um, multitasking, and again, specifically among heavy multitaskers, the people that seem to be doing it the most. Um, and what's really interesting about some of the research that his colleagues and himself have done in this lab is that the frequent multitaskers don't, they're not just bad at multitasking. They actually tend to have lower success rates at doing different tasks, even when they're not multitasking, uh, suggesting that Again, they might actually have more um, cognitive limitations to begin with, um, or perhaps as a consequence. We can um, talk to that 
uh, we can talk about that aspect in a little bit. But um, I want to um, take a look at, I want you to um, check out just, um, a, this is, I'm sorry, the video is a little bit fuzzy, but um, this just explains um, what's going on in um, Dr. Nass's lab. Uh, you can see some of the experiments that he's run to um, come to these conclusions about heavy multitaskers. So let's just watch that for a couple minutes. Vowels or consonants. Oh, I, I'm but sorry. Right. Let me rewind that. Nass allowed us to go. film one of his studies, conducted on a group of carefully chosen students. On a college campus, most kids are doing two things at once, maybe three things at once. These are kids who are doing five, six or more things at once all the time. The experiment looks simple. Identify numbers as odd or even, letters as vowels or consonants. But it's rife with traps in the form of distractions. NASA is testing how quickly these kids can switch between tasks without losing their focus. I'm pretty much constantly texting. And whenever I study, I have my laptop out and listen. Brian is a junior. I'm watching a YouTube video. I'm checking my email nonstop, refreshing the page. I'm on Facebook, Facebook chat. He's pretty confident that his multitasking is successful. So that I can always stay connected. So you think you're effective? I think so. Okay. But his results, like others NASA has tested, suggested otherwise. What we found was that you're actually significantly slower when you're switching than when you're doing kind of the same task uh, consistently. Uh, Virtually all multitaskers think they are brilliant at multitasking. And one of the big discoveries is, you know what? You're really lousy at it. It turns out Multitaskers are terrible at every aspect of multitasking. They get distracted constantly. Their memory is very disorganized. Recent work we've done suggests they're worse at analytic reasoning. We worry that it may be creating people who are unable to think well and clearly. When I got back to New York, I noticed how much I too fell prey to distractions. I kept catching myself in the act checking my email when I should have been writing a script, Googling something to satisfy a random curiosity. This is affecting all of us. Okay, so um, for the record, if you're interested in, in watching more of that, um, that's a Frontline episode, a PBS Frontline episode um, that, that you can actually get if you go to Frontline's um, website, uh, and you can watch all the different um, segments. There's also extended interviews with um, Clifford Nass and a couple of other people who have sort of high stakes and sort of these debates that we're having about um, the effects of media multitasking. Um, I do, you know, uh, want to bring up that... Um, before we go into these consequences of multi media multitasking, um, I do want to bring up that, you know, uh, Dr. Nass sort of says that he's making a causal claim about multitasking leading to these, um, you know, things like not, again, not just ba uh, bad results while people are multitasking, but you saw in there that the high multitaskers also had um, worse analytical reasoning skills. Um, and he's sort of suggesting that multitasking comes before... Um, it, and, and then as a consequence, right, that we sort of, uh, are, something changes in our brains and we become less um, able to multitask. Well, this is going to become something that I, I'll, I'll talk about a little bit more today and also tomorrow because I, I think we should be really critical about that only because we don't know if there was something that just makes these um, people who maybe start off with lower analytical skills, for instance, more likely to multitask um, anyway. Either way, I, I mean, I, I think it's an important finding, just that um, the, con the confidence that people have in media multitasking should be checked, because technically, the more confident you are, um, th the more likely it is that you're actually really not that good at it. <laughs> so, um, okay, so the, let's just talk a little bit about the negative consequences of media multitasking. I've kind of organized it into four major um, categories of consequence. So we've already been talking about this first one, the decreases in productivity. Um, just again, this is exactly um, what uh, the, the things going on in NASA's lab was showing. Less media multitasking tends to be more. Okay, that's that's the message. Um, th there is, and this is a, a, a big sidebar, but it's something I'd, I would like to pursue in my own time to f find out exactly what the limitations of this are. Um, and it was it was an interview with Clifford Nass where this was mentioned. There's one notable media multitasking situation where productivity does not seem to be affected, and that's when people are listening to music and trying to do something else at the same time. Um, apparently, there's a, a, a there's a special 
center in the brain for processing music that's separate from all of those areas that we talked about in the last lecture that um, working memory things like that so it's not using up their cognitive capacity um, and just doesn't have any problems I've <laughs> the reason this was shocking to me is because I've um, I've stopped listening to music unless I'm trying to do kind of like a mindless task. I do a lot of things like data entry and things like that. And I can do that. Um, I can even watch TV, actually. Well, I mean, <laughs> perhaps perhaps I shouldn't be so overconfident. But um, I have been able to watch TV and, and, and get things done. But, you know, when I'm concentrating on something, I, personally, I find that music is... Um, even music is somewhat distracting, and I'm wondering if it's because I'm paying attention to the lyrics, but um, that is a very interesting finding, especially if you're talking about media multitasking. There, there may be some exceptions. Okay, so another um, really important consequence, um, of course, is threat to safety. Uh, and this, uh, I would say, um, is probably why media multitasking since, tends to be a very hot topic right now, because uh, uh, People are, you know, people's lives are in danger because some of the media multitasking. Um, I, I don't mean to keep bringing it up as an example, but I think it's important to sort of um, understand what's actually going on when we talk about driving and cell phone use. Of course, there's different ways to use a cell phone while you're driving. Um, and one of them is texting. And that's, uh, uh, well, let's see, one presentation um, I saw the, the, the psychologist brought up the fact that, yeah, that... Forget like using up brain capacity, right? If you're texting and driving, you're literally taking your eyes off the road. So multitasking or not, you're just not, you're not even performing the, the primary task, driving, um, like you should be. But let's just talk about something a little bit more nuanced and I think people that uh, tend not to think is as dangerous, which is just simply talking on the phone, okay? Um, so what's interesting is that um, some of the studies suggest that even when you're using hands-free devices, so even when you have both of your two hands, just talking on the cell phone, right, results in um, a, a, a very high level of distraction. Um, the, this one um, study down here uh, noted that planning to speak and listening, so just thinking about what you're going to say next, and listening to people uh, on the, while you're on the cell phone put far more demands on the brain's resources than, uh, than listening, okay? So, um, I'm sorry, I said listening earlier. So planning to speak um, and speaking put more demands than just listening. So maybe you could just, you know, listen to somebody on speakerphone, it would be fine, but if you're engaging in talking, then um, you still are using up some of those resources. Um, and again, this is even with hands-free devices um, that, that cognitive performance is being um, decreased. Not, not to say that, that hands-free devices don't offer, you know, a, an added benefit, but it's still not perfect. Um, here, actually, I thought this was great. Um, this is an illustration of what happens to the visual field when you're driving while talking, hands-free, remember. So um, this is even if you're ha you have your Bluetooth or your speakerphone or whatever. Um, you can see that the um, this is like your normal sort of scope of vision while you're driving normally. But um, when people get on their cell phones and are actually doing the talking, they're still able to see what's in front of them, but look at all the peripheral, you know, awareness that they lose. And again, the source of this is because <clears throat> all these like um, cognitive research. Whoa. Okay. No, 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 no. Okay, sorry. The source of this is that all these cognitive resources, right, um, are, are that we need for attention. Because remember, our attention is just um, like all these other limits in the brain, where it only has a finite uh, amount of resources that we can use. And if we're using some up. Right, then um, all we can still focus on like one thing, but that searchlight function right diminishes a little bit. We can't see as much around us. Um, interestingly enough, I have like a little note over here. I think this is very interesting. Notably, some of the studies have found that non-mediated talking isn't as big of a problem. So, yeah, that's right. So that means the backseat driver, you know, right, like isn't as much as a, as a distraction as your cell phone. Um, no, so if somebody else is in the car with you, it's not as a, a big a deal. Now, why do you think that is? Why would it be that somebody who's sitting next to you and talking to you right there is not um, as big as, or it, it doesn't seem to result in the same type of problem? Maybe I should phrase it that way as uh, somebody talking on the cell phone. Well, the interesting, what, what they seem to be suggesting, and they're doing this based on accident rates, so there seems to be a lower incident of accidents when people 
have other people in the car that they're talking to. And um, it's simply because they offer another pair of eyes. So maybe, um, I think this is an interesting thing to think about, maybe your cognitive resources for, you know, your attentional resources are somewhat diminished when you're talking to them, but what ends up happening is, is if, let's say, there's a car coming towards you or, or you know, something that you wouldn't have noticed, you know, an animal running out on the road, uh, there's another person there that's sort of like stretching your attention because they're also um, maybe functioning with limited attentional resources, but with your powers combined, um, you're able to see that. So I thought that was very interesting. Okay, um, another consequence um, is the hindrance of health and development. Um, this this isn't something that is normally discussed very much, but um, there's a lot of evidence um, that chronic multitasking can have negative effects on your health. Um, one reason for that is just simply um, if you're doing a primary task that's taking up a lot of your attention, you're just not paying attention to other things you do. So for instance, you might consume more calories than you should while you're eating. Um, and there's been numerous studies that talk about um, <clears throat> the um you know the links between obesity and uh watching um television in front of the tv and nothing's ever that simple in these correlational studies but um i do think there's something to be said about um if you're not being mindful of tasks like eating because your attention is elsewhere um then you do risk um, maybe engaging in some less healthy behaviors um but i think even more convincingly is that we know that high levels of cognitive demands, right? When these cognitive demands are so much greater than our cognitive capacity, then our body has um, pretty pr pretty severe stress responses, as <laughs> perhaps it should, right? Um, the, the brain responds when we, we put a lot of multitasking demands on it, right? Um, by pumping adrenaline, because it's trying to prepare us for action. Um, but adrenaline's a stress hormone, and there's other stress hormones, and if you're constantly multitasking and sort of um, explaining to the brain that you're in a panic state and need to, you know, try to get multiple things done at once, then um, all these stress hormones could take a, a pretty bad toll on the body. Um, in fact, um, one study suggests that over time, uh, these stress hormones, and again, these could be stress hormones from anywhere, but the fact that multitasking can emit them is pretty interesting, can do permanent damage to the brain cells, frankly, that help you multitask, so um, specifically with memory. So people might... Um, actually, because they've been multitasking, uh, end up having trouble doing more things at the one time, at one time precisely because um, they're sort of damaging brain functions over time. I mean, th this is sort of long-term consequences, I think. Um, <clears throat> now, a much more controversial idea, and I do think that this is alluded to in um, some of Clifford Nass's research, is that multitasking could be changing brain structures like the um, frontal cortex, prefrontal cortex, uh, particularly among youth because um, their brain's a little bit more malleable, that it's not fully developed yet, so the things that happen are, you know, might leave a little bit more of an impression while things are still in development. Uh, this is, again, I just want to point this out, this is a really controversial idea. Um, the things that I like about it is that it, um, it, it suggests that you know, the multitasking um, affects the plasticity, you know, our brains are very, um, ha have a high level of plasticity, which means that they can um, adapt to our technologies and the way that we use things, they can change, we can, we can um, actually develop new associations, and all sorts of things, and there's a lot of research going on, and, and that type of research would on, on brain plasticity would suggest that, that that an effect like that is actually possible. But we really don't have much research to illustrate it. And one of the things that sort of bothers me about it is that um, I am afraid that it's just sort of a knee-jerk fear response about uh, new, you know, new medias, the way that we use technologies as if to say, oh my god, you know, technology is, is, is it's hurting our brains. So um, I, I, I would just recommend that, you know, you pay close attention to the research developments, but I wouldn't read too much into this yet because it's really difficult to show that multitasking influences the brain development and not the other way around. What if it's people with a certain type of prefrontal cortex that end up engaging in more multitasking to begin with, right? What if there's something, what if there's triggers in the brain that lead to the behavior and not the other way around? So um, I think we just need to be you know, cautious as we're learning more about what's actually happening in these processes. Um, <clears throat> Finally, this is also, I don't think, talked about a, as much 
within the research setting, but I think in our own social lives this, this will um, could sort of resonate with a lot of you. Medium multitasking um, can do some damage to our relationships. On one hand, um, I think I think one of the the big drives to multitask, of course, is to help connect us with other people. Um, and, and 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 so on that level, um, it's a very good thing for our relationships. It helps us stay connected. But the need to stay to to constantly connect with others um, could actually intrude on the people that we might be sharing actual space with, right? So um, how many have had the experience where you go out to dinner with some friends or maybe sit around the dinner table? Um, this picture illustrates it quite nicely. And everybody's sitting there on their device um, communicating with other people at the same time, right? So it's, it's an example of media multitasking where you, your needs for connection with others through this technology might actually be, you know, taking you away from um, other social um other, other social engagements, uh, when, when families come home together, right, um, and people don't necessarily leave work, but they're still trying to engage with the family, you know, there's, there's going to be some sort of conflict there. Um, I think the Dilbert, conflict, uh, the Dilbert comic up there illustrates it quite well. Um, and uh, what research there is out there, again, this is, it comes from um, uh, a, a colleague of NASA's um, and himself again, did a survey of 8 to 12 year old girls, um, this is fairly recent, and they found that greater media multitasking is so, was associated with uh, worse social and emotional development. Okay, and they did, I mean, I, I won't go into too many details, they, social and emotional development was, um, I used a lot of different variables to tap into that, but I, regardless, okay, I, I just want to bring up this point again. You can't really establish a causal link, though, between multitasking and social development. What if, you know, what if um, girls that um, tend to have, you know, maybe a little bit worse social or emotional development engage in more media multitasking um, because of, you know, they're trying to compensate for social deficits or something like that. Um, Still, I, again, I, I mean, like everything, it's just the, you take the good with the bad. I will say that um, regardless of what the case is, whether it's that girls that have um, not so great social and emotional development engage in more multitasking or multitasking leads to, you know, lower social and emotional development, I, I do think it underscores the need to emphasize face-to-face -face, face -to -face connections um, that occur without some simultaneous media use. I still think there's a need for that, um, regardless of what it is, uh, what, whatever these findings are, that is. Um, <clears throat> okay, so, I, I, you know, we just went through a little laundry list of things that are not so great about media multitasking. Uh, and, and, of course, yesterday we went, we went into um, the issues of, well, well, you know, our brain literally isn't set up to do multitasking. So if this is so bad, then, then why do we do it? Um, and again, I've categorized this into a couple of different issues here. One is um, environmental pressure. I mean, sometimes we simply have no choice. We can't always control what's in our environment, and we still need to get things done. And uh, uh, of course, you know, there's, we talked last time about there being different types of interference and, and the ways that we can get around ignoring some things, but sometimes we just can't. I mean, you might be in a situation where you need to get some work done and there's a television on, and all of a sudden you find yourself media multitasking, but it's not necessarily something that's an, in your direct control. Um, another um, thing that I, I think is pretty important is just there's cultural pressure. We have ideas in our culture about what it means to be productive, and multitasking is one of them. Um, I mentioned in an example last time how um, you'll see even job um, ads and job requisitions that re specifically request people who can multitask. Um, I also think um, we tend to idealize people that we see juggling multiple things, like, oh, wow, like that person, you know, can handle it all, uh, and, and, and wishing that you yourself could do more, right? There's... We don't look down on multitaskers, right? We 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 elevate them. Um, we're impressed with them, uh, even if again, remember the people who do it the most might not be the best at it. Um, also, you know, on that note, right? There is a little bit of overconfidence, um, and I, I say heavy multitaskers. Um, you know, we know that they tend to be impulsive, sensation-seeking, and overconfident in their ability to handle and benefit from multitasking. Um, I would argue even moderate multitaskers could have some of those characteristics of at least overconfidence. Um, it's another good reason to sort of take more uh, classes like this where uh, 
you might be a little bit better at checking that overconfidence. Um, and then some of the more interesting research that's coming out now is talking about the emotional gratifications we get from multitasking. And I think this is huge. Um, we don't necessarily get cognitive benefits from multitasking. If anything, we're getting, we're having cognitive problems, right? But turns out when um, the, the, some recent research talks about how we're getting huge emotional gratifications, it soothes us in a way to, to, to feel like we're doing uh, so many things at once. It makes us feel good. Um, and, and that leads to another interesting possibility, which is that um, there could even be an addictive quality to media multitasking. I don't think there's been any research on this yet. Um, but if it's tapping into certain reward centers in the brain, uh, then it could be the type of thing, you know, chronic multitaskers are chronic because um, it's just what they do. It's, it's become automatic and it's probably, it could be hard for them to stop. Um, this is uh, another little distraction, but um, I think that there's a video, a Portlandia skit that illustrates this possibility pretty well. And even if, um, and even if there's not an actual addictive quality, I think this might remind you of some people you know. Let's just take a look at this um, funny little skit. All right, little plug for Portlandia there. Um, uh, but I do, you know, in all honesty, I, I think this is a pretty interesting um, illustration. If I mean, silly, yes, but illustration of something that I think a lot of us feel, which is like, it's just really hard to escape some of this stuff. And it's so habitual to constantly be checking email and things like that. that um, and I presumably get a lot of emotional gratification from it um, that these, uh, I, I like the, the idea of a technology loop are sometimes hard to get out of. Um, Let's see. Okay. Um, but uh, I can't impress upon you enough, <laughs> I'm sure you feel the same way, that um, despite all of these, uh, I, you know, problematic aspects of media multitasking, um, you know, I, 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 I don't think that it's all bad. I do, however, think that saying it's good is premature. Um, there is some very, very limited evidence that there could actually be some positive effects of media multitasking or at least positive associations um, and there in one study um, this um, this first study I have listed up here certain cognitive resources may be enhanced over time by multitasking there was a study that suggested that um, in in the presence of distraction um, I, I think there were heavy multitaskers and light multitaskers and they were asked to do tasks um, with and without the presence of like a, a a sound that kept coming in and the heavy multitaskers were better at the task in in the face of that sort of distracting noise uh, implying that they might there might be something in multitasking that actually leads us to work better when we're having to process multi-sensory information um, 
you know, and, and of course I already sort of mentioned before that there's positive effects of, of being constantly connected. And that's one reason I think um, that we're constantly multitasking. Um, but again, I, I <laughs> do, do I think it's a good thing? No, I just want to suggest that it might not be entirely bad and we should, you know, look at this um, even handedly um, in all aspects. Um, okay, well, um, that's all I wanted to cover today. Um, next time we're going to be talking about ways to sort of not necessarily get out of tech loops, though that might be one of them. I like the technology loop thing. Uh, but just ways that we can better cope with sort of our multitasking environment. Little strategies were, that might help us uh, uh, at least temporarily leave technology loops or even while we're in them reduce some of that those stress hormones and things like that. Um, in the meantime, I have some discussion questions, and as always, I would really appreciate your participation. If um, you want to contribute um, to, to, to some of the discussion that centers around these questions on, we have discussion boards at wvucommook.org, but we also have um, Twitter, if you use the wvucommook hashtag, and there's a Facebook group, and I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on these. Um, first one, what do you think are the consequences of children growing up in a culture where media multitasking is the norm? It's a pretty broad question. Um, and, and you might even have your own personal experiences with this. Um, what positive and or negative effects has media multitasking had in your own life? Again, I'd like to hear sort of both sides, like how you think you've benefited from different media multitasking situations and not. Um, and finally, do you think we've established widely accepted etiquette? on when it is and when it's not appropriate to use media technologies in face-to-face -face social contexts. I think it's an interesting question because when we talk about the social drawbacks and the social benefits, I'm not really sure if there's any um, etiquette that's been established to sort of to, to say, well, this is appropriate and it's not. It seems to vary in different social situations. On one hand, we're regulating media multitasking like you know, texting and driving through laws, but how are we how are we as a society sort of um, managing these new social issues that arise when people are trying to media multitask in our social interactions? So if, you, if, if you're aware of such an etiquette that you think is pretty standard, what is it? And if, and if you're not, you know, why, why do you think that is? And what do you think the etiquette should be for media multitasking in social situations? Again, I look forward to hearing your responses, and I look forward to seeing you for the final um, media multitasking session where we're going to be talking about these solutions. Thank you very much.